In this video, we're going to build an Arduino based autopilot using low cost parts and packing it into this 3D printed device. Now, keep in mind before beginning this project that it relies on using SPAD Next as the middleware interface between this hardware and SIM Connect with Microsoft Flight Sim. Setting out for this project, I did a search for already shared models thinking this would be a great way to start this little community project. Now these models make it easy for us to 3D print, whether we've got our own printers or using services like Shapeways. I went over to Thingsverse and found this one. I've dropped it into Fusion 360 and then just extended the lip on the edge uh, to make it go into a more of a panel mount capable unit. However, you can also just print it out with the standard square box size. All the hardware that we're gonna need is really not that expensive. Starting it off, we focus on the 3D material and the build of the print. Now, if you won't want it to take too long, you can run on the medium setting like I did. However, you're probably gonna have to invest some time sanding it down and then painting it. In my case, I didn't bother, but if I really cared about this unit's quality and, and finish, I probably would have gone at a high setting and maybe taken a day or so to print, and I would have chosen a dark gray or black material, uh, and then I wouldn't have had to worry about it. When it came to the electronics, we decided to use the low-cost Arduino R3 as the brains of the microcontroller. We added on some of the simple push buttons, a prototype PCB board, which we can buy off the shelf and then mount our buttons to it. We chose a 2004 I2C LCD. This is gonna allow us to only require a couple of pins to do all of the writing of the characters. We also chose a simple six-way rotary switch and one of the low cost rotary encoders. These are the styles that come on the PCB that you get in a lot of the Arduino kits. Now it also has a built in push button so that gives us an extra button in the system. Now the 3D model included some knobs that would be printed out, but I went with some low cost knobs I got for some other projects. These are basically similar to what you'd see on guitars or other electronics knobs. I also went this way because I didn't have the required size nut and bolts that would fit inside of the printed device to be able to tighten it onto the shaft of the encoder. The brains of this device has to be an Arduino Uno because of the box and the layout. However, there are a couple of things that need to be considered when using an Uno. One of the things that I could not get to work was the keypad library, while also using the I2C library. This means we are limited from being able to do the matrix keypads and extending the total number of buttons and switches that we can have. The second thing is the fact that D13, since it's connected to the built-in LED, you can't drive this using the input pull-up. So for it, we'll have to tie it to the five volt bus and run it as an input mode. For all the other switches, we'll be able to tie those to ground and run them as digital pins, enabling the input pull-ups. The LCD 2004 I2C that we went with has a blue backlight and white letters. However, that's just the one I had from a kit. You can find lots of these with different colors and backlightings and pick the one that suits best for your layout. One thing I did do was I removed the jumper which ties the 5 volt uh, VCC into the VIN for the LCD. And so instead, I could have designed in adding a potentiometer so I could control the brightness. However, I tied it to the 3.3 volt rail instead, put that onto the VIN side of the jumper, and I found that the, the brightness was enough for me. Make sure you power this up before you fully enclose it into a box. On the back, you've got a small potentiometer, which you can use for adjusting the contrast. So you wanna make sure that once you've got it up and powered up and you're reading some of the characters, you adjust the contrast and set it exactly how you like it. 
on the rotary switch were short by one pin to make all of this work independently. But that's okay. What we're going to do is we're going to do a little bit of comparison code in our Arduino code. And that is going to sort out when the switch is in the sixth position without requiring its own dedicated pin connection to the Arduino. The Thingsverse design gives us a few of the pieces that need to be printed. Once we've got them, we'll be able to put them together with the buttons and a clamp piece. So you're going to notice that between the buttons, the main shell, and the little back plate, you're going to use those to clamp down your PCB board and align the buttons on top. I used a little bit of hot glue to just tack it in place uh, before I got the clamp down. And that just made sure that kept my buttons in alignment and then I put the little clamp in place and screwed it down. The Arduino screws in real easy. The standoffs align and using self-tapping screws meant for plastic, this wasn't a problem. Now the rotary switch and encoder, I needed to do a little bit of sanding work. So I suggest doing the Arduino after you've made sure to fit your rotary switch and encoder. This will allow you time to sand down the edge, sand down the inside, sand down the backside until you get it so that the shaft with threads comes through far enough that you can finally grab it with the nut and then tighten it down with some pliers. The LCD2004 also aligns perfectly with the opening and its standoffs. Now there's not much room on the side for the header pins. So depending on your skill set, you might want to consider removing the header pins and just soldering the wires directly to the board. In my case, I found I was able to plug in using the DuPont jumpers and I didn't have any issue with it pinching or causing disconnects. We're using the standard DuPont 40 pin jumper wires, mostly the male to female connectors and that connects the Arduino um, to the display and to the rotary encoder which is on the little PCB with standoffs. For the rotary switch and the buttons, I took the male ends and kept that side but I cut off a lot of the female ends and then I stripped back the wire and I soldered that in. Now that we have it all together, let's move on and look at how we implement the Arduino code and leverage the spad.next examples and the command messenger library. Let's head on over and look at that. So at the top in the header, I've just got some information explaining that we're using the spad.next serial interface version one. So we're using an I squared C uh, 2004, so 20 character wide, four lines total LCD, uses I squared C. Six position rotary switch, a rotary encoder with a push button, and we've got eight additional autopilot function buttons. Now, when it comes to encoders, I have found no better way to do it than using Ben Buxton's code. Um, more information in the link, uh, but effectively nothing has been as clean. Spad Dext uh, 9, 10, 13 was the minimum when I started doing this. It's actually at dot 14 now but it was working with dot 13. And then all the documentation, if you want to look at this stuff, head over to the GitHub and all the information plus a basic getting started uh, example that you can use, which this technically got based off of. We're also going to use VJoy as a means to emulate buttons. So instead of having to put all the functions in our code, we'll use a VJoy as the means to do our button mapping inside of spad.next. That way, every plane, we can assign different functions, which of course will be helpful when we're dealing with LVARs for complex aircraft. We're gonna use the script panel as a means to redirect the data that we want to display. That way, again, will be able to remap on a plane by plane basis. I throw in the wiring as the means in which the way I connected it, the rotary switch. So what we did was uh, to run out of pins by one, but still get the sixth. We're gonna fix all that using code by checking all the others. And if all of them 
are not on, then he's got to be on. Then for all of our autopilot mode buttons, uh, they've been wired, and then this explains how we do it. And then as mentioned, with the Uno, because of the LED uh, on pin 13, input pull-ups don't work. So instead, we're going to go input mode and have to drive it high, whereas all the others will use input pull-ups, so you pull them low to ground. We need to include wire.h, so that's the library that handles the I squared C bus. We need to include the liquid crystal I squared C dot uh, H library, and then we've got our include messenger dot H. Liquid crystal I squared C LCD 0x2724. This is the address. So the beauty of the I squared C bus is you could have multiple displays or multiple I squared C devices and you only need to use the same two pins for transmit and receive because everybody has an address. So this guy's address 27. So listening for the serial connection for messages. So command messenger uh, is gonna be messenger. So that's the variable and serial for the serial port. We're gonna use VJoy and it's important to know what your device ID is. So again, all of this was based on me using the second VJoy instance. I used VJoy 1 inside of Microsoft Flight Sim for mapping all of my camera views and a whole bunch of other functions that we can't yet access through the SDK from SPAD.next. Here, we're using the Arduino to press the VJoy button and SPAD to then send the command. So the second VJoy is the one that we're using. And the string for that is string is going to be one, two, three, four, colon, B E A D, colon, one. And that's about how the HID device explains itself. This comes from the um, SPAD.next example where he sets up a Boolean is ready. Um, and you start off with it being false. So I kept this stuff the same intentionally to try to keep it as common as possible. There are four, well, five, zero through four command channels inside of spad.next. And again, if you go to spad.next, uh, the wiki up above, you can read about these. But effectively, channel zero is a request from spad.next, and that is in the documentation as command zero k command equals one this is going to be the uh document information but this is the command to spad.next k event so the two channel these are the events from spad.next again all your documentation listed out under command two the third channel is the debug channel so we'll call uh, that k debug and then what we've got for the simulation so event simulation uh, listed as channel four, so this is ksim command four. Now these are for sending actual sim commands uh, and being able to send sim connect and LVARs and stuff. We're not gonna use this. Now other people have used this, but it means that you now have to modify your Arduino code if you need to change those, those up, which is where you run into that problem of now you need to have kind of a whole bunch of variables and a whole bunch of if statements, if, it's this aircraft, do this. If it's a different aircraft, use a different set. In our case, we're instead gonna be throwing up those VJoy commands. The next part uh, you'll find is command IDs five through nine are reserved. So that's expansion in spad.next. And then command IDs 10 to 49, this is for us to expose and or subscribe to data that we're going to receive or put in and out of spad.next. I just set up some variables, receive, autopilot mode. Uh, that'll be on command channel 10, flight director mode on 11, heading mode on 12, nav mode on 13, altitude mode on 14, uh, IAS mode on 15, VS mode on 16, approach mode on 17, reverse mode on 18. Then I've got the overall received data value. Now this channel is gonna be the channel that we dis we change what the display is updating. And so this is great. Think of it like a window or a single screen. And we're gonna use the script panel to dynamically change this data. Now I am not yet using these other variables. 
because everything is based on the the rotary switch position and we're just updating this this one channel 20 with data and changing it out these i may use in the future finally i want to send so these are all receives right i'm going to be listening to whatever the sim is telling me to display however for the uh, selector switch i want to send the variable because spad's going to use that as its conditional element so channel 27 is going to be a value which we're updating from inside of the arduino and it's just saying what position the selector switch the rotary switch is in now with spad.next you have to have things called callbacks a callback is the method for the sim to send us information so we need to attach these callbacks using messenger.attach and this is going to be the name of the function um, that we are able to run and that function can then also have a value it subscribes to so you'll see here that we're going to subscribe the RAPM so the auto pilot master mode effectively the AP mode that is going to when that comes in it's going to fire off the on AP mode on function so basically every time we want to interact um, to and from the sim with data and we want the sim to send data back to us we need a callback so the first callback and again this this is a standard item from spad.next on an unknown command so when something comes in and our arduino does not know how to process that command we're going to send back to the debug channel string of unknown command it'll show up in the debug inside of spad.next that the thing you send me i don't know what to do with it now what you'll notice is I've started to encapsulate all of my strings using the F macro. So the F macro will make it so that this doesn't hold up the variable, the limited variable space and instead puts it into the storage space and then we'll go fetch it. This saves all kinds of space in an Uno on identify request. So this is when the K request channel, right? So on the K request channel, run this function. So when the K request channel comes in, then what happens is we're going to request. So character, we're going to read the string argument. So it's going to bring in whatever it is. Um, we're going to string compare. If request equals init, then, and that's zero, right? So initial declaration. So that's an it. So K request. So what we're going to do is we're going to start a command of K request. So that's the channel. And then we're going to go uh, messenger command arguments. So we're adding SPAD. Then we're adding our unique device ID. Remember, you need to change this. Uh, just do a Google search for unique ID creator. Um, or go to the SPAD documentation because in the SPAD documentation there is a link with instructions on how to create it. This is going to create a unique USB device ID. You need these to be unique, otherwise you're going to have problems. Then you can give it a name, so I called this simple autopilot, right? And then messenger command end. So this will send that off and it will init. Anytime it gets a ping on command channel zero, it's basically going to reply with a pong and the value. And so what this does is it, it's the watchdog timer. It's just a keep alive to make sure that everything is going good. So now we move on to the configuration portion. So when the config command comes in, so after we've done that, we get our king config command in. Now this is when we start exposing all of those um, data elements that we want to subscribe to so obviously the command channel this is a one so we want to send to spad.next and then we're going to add so this is going to add a variable to spad.next now you could subscribe 
to an actual SIMVAR if you were looking to subscribe to a SIMVAR. And like I said, instead of us subscribing to specific variables that would require us to come in and modify it from plane to plane, instead, we're going to create this variable and we are going to add it into spad.next and it's going to go into the local variables and that is now going to give us our ability to go to the script panel and start redirecting or basically filling this data from the simulator data that we want i.e the autopilot mode right with a default it's going to use the default autopilot mode with a, an advanced lvar based one like the crj we need to use a different variable and so we're going to redirect using the script panel so we're going to add this is going to be the definition of the variable so that's the command channel or channel 10 right so we keep that from up here remember that's this here we are channel 10 apm right the autopilot mode so then we're going to give it a string this will become serial the GUID ID and then this is kind of like our folder and then we've got our uh, variable that we're going to call it so this way you can break them up into folders if you like so autopilot modes and then the others will be autopilot values so you can kind of you know logically group your stuff this is going to be an unsigned eight um, so you have to pick from these so obviously we'll go with a u8 and this is read write so you can have read only variables so the spad would only be able to read them and not write to them but i want spad to actually overwrite this and make it bi-directional to a comms finally what is the name for the ui well this is autopilot mode state so then we just literally copied pasted changed it all over for now flight director mode so the way i set this up course or crs doesn't mean anything as an autopilot mode um, so that button uh, that printed off i'm repurposing to use that button as my flight director we got our flight director mode and it's a u8 it's a read write and then flight director mode state so now we do the same thing for heading same thing for the nav mode same thing for the altitude mode same thing for IAS mode, same thing for VS mode, same thing for approach mode, and then again, same thing. And you'll see here, these ones I didn't short form. I left them much bigger. You can even add um, putting in descriptions. So you can have a name and you can have a description if you want. So it gives more information to spad.next. So we did our VS modes, our approach mode, our reverse mode. And then we started to expose those data values. So here I put those in autopilot values. And data V, this is gonna be the window that we're able to have the SIM change all the data for us. Uh, so in reality, all these extra values that I'm putting up there, I don't really need uh, at this time. I may at some point use them directly, like I've mentioned, uh, but the reality is we could remove all this and be fine. The only one that I care to keep right now uh, is the selector. So this one, you'll notice we're going to add it, and this is going to be the switch and the rotary selector. So this is our selector switch, and this is how spad.next is going to know which mode our control panel is in, because we're going to use that for how the rotary encoder is to function and which data we're supposed to be writing into the data value window. Once you've finished adding all of your channels, then you need to send the, the, to the K request channel config. And once you've done that, then spad.next knows you've completed the config. And at this point, we're gonna set that is ready boolean to true and then that way you can use that with some of your statements to make sure that not only is the data correct but the sim is ready considering all of the stuff we're doing won't function because we're not triggering events locally meaning i'm not going to run that function locally the function is going to only be run 
when data changes coming down from um, spad.next. So I don't end up using the is ready Boolean as a check, uh, but you will see it in other examples. Now that we've configured and everything is great, now we want to do all of our callback functions. So here's all of those modes we have for callback functions. So for the autopilot mode on, and this is going to be the same for all of them, it's an integer 32T new autopilot mode. Now, this is a local variable running inside of here, so it's not taking up global variable space. Uh, it's only run when the AP mode on function. So it's not a global variable. So it's going to read messenger, read integer 32 argument. So the on AP mode on function was run. And so now it's going to read the data that came along with that call for that callback. So what's in the channel, what's coming down in the AP mode channel. If it equals a one, then we're going to, on the LCD, we're going to set the cursor to top left, zero, zero. Then we're going to LCD, we're going to print. And again, we use the F macro so that this doesn't take up all kinds of, of global variable space, which we are limited on. Just type out AP and a couple of spaces, right? So it gives itself a, a gap. And that basically turns on our autopilot enunciator. It will also send to the debug channel that AP enunciator is on. So again, when you're debugging and doing a lot of your initial work, uh, it's great to have these things so that you can see inside of spad.next that the function did happen. If it's not equal to a one, I want it to turn off the AP enunciator. So it's almost like an LED turning on behind the letters is the way to think about this. But that means we need to blank out that portion of the display. So we just set the cursor back to zero, zero, and then we write the same amount, but in spaces. And now we're sending back enunciator off. The flight director, right, here I'm putting this on the second line right below the AP enunciator. So copy paste, same information, new flight director mode, right? We're just changing stuff. And for this, I'm setting it to the first character on the left of the screen, but the second line. So remember everything's zero based. So top left corner is zero, zero. One down from it is zero, one. And now we're gonna write flight director and flight director enunciator is on. Otherwise, blank it out. So then we're gonna do the exact same thing. And now we're gonna go to the fourth character on the first line and we're gonna start working with heading. And we'll do the same thing. If heading mode is enabled, turn on the HDG letters. If it's not, blank it out. We're gonna put nav mode right below heading mode and same premise for one because it's now same starting point, but one below. Our IAS speed mode, flight level change. So if you prefer, instead of IAS, you want FLC, this is where you could come in and you could change this to FLC. We're gonna go one below IAS on the top, VS mode on the bottom, just cause we can. So if VS is on, we'll turn on VS mode. We move over to the right again. Now we're gonna do altitude mode, blank it out. Uh, and I'm putting nothing currently below altitude mode. And instead we move over to the right and on the top right, starting at basically character 17, we're gonna do a approach mode. And you'll notice I put the space on the left. Um, I could have put no space there and changed this to 17. I just did it this way to uh, right justify the text. And then we put reverse mode the same way below it. Instead of having to print all these different data values depending on information, we came up with the concept of using a single data variable and we're gonna do all kinds of conditions inside of spad.next. And so anytime spad.next changes that data value, it's just going to write it to that space. But first, it's going to blank it out. 
the purpose of this is say we had altitude with 32,000 on it and then we're switching to VS mode. This will first blank it out, then reprint the new data, which is going to be the VS data. So that could be, you know, 500 feet. And, and that way you don't end up with leftover uh, text. So it's a, you're effectively clearing that portion of the screen, but the easiest way to do it is to set the cursor to that spot, blank it all out, then set the cursor back to the beginning of that line. So the character 10 uh, on line four, and then print out the new data that's coming in. And then we're just sending back to the command channel that that's what we printed. That covered all of our callbacks that we created as functions to be triggered when data comes to us from spad.next to send us data from the sim. Now let's go ahead and configure or set up all of our encoders, our buttons, and our switches. So first up, we're doing the encoder setup. Now this is based on the Ben Buxton code from above. Again, this works 100% every single time. You'll notice that I leave some comments explaining about half step. The fact is, Prop wash dual concentric encoders, which I like a lot. They're a decent price. Um, they seem to work well for me. Those work with half step. So I just leave that comment in case you ever end up using those ones. The basic Arduino encoder that we're using actually does not use half steps. So we've commented out, right? So uncommented, commented out half step. Also, because we're using the PCB style from the Arduino um, PCB, we connected it with positive five volts, negative ground, which is only used with the push button switch. And then we're using the clock and data um, connections. And so because it's got resistors and things on the board, it's expecting that we're actually supplying five volts to it. So in that case, it is not all using pull-ups. When I'm using the raw prop wash encoders, I connect both commons to just ground, and then I connect the A's and the B's um, directly to pins. So in that case, I have to use pull-ups. So in this case, not using pull-ups. Then for defining the number of rotaries, so how many rotaries are you gonna have? And remember, it's per clockwise counterclockwise turn set. If I have a dual concentric, then that's the equivalent of two encoders. So for every two pins, it's per rotary. In this case, we've only got the one rotary. So rotary def structure, uh, byte pin one, byte pin two, integer clockwise character, or counterclockwise character, integer clockwise character, and then a volatile unsigned character state for state. Next up, you are gonna take a structure and you're gonna build this for rotaries, def, rotaries, num rotaries. So how many is expecting? So then it creates its structure. Then you're putting in your pins, three, two, and that equals to zero and to one for, go, for the pins going into code. So if I put in another rotary, if it was on pins four and five, right? that would then be two, three, zero. Cause that also gets used for when you're writing the characters and using those inside of the matrix keypad, which of course we are not doing in this sketch. We got our one guy, three and two. Note, this is exactly what to change if your rotary is going the wrong way. So obviously three, two doesn't make any sense. It was two, three, I then ran my code and I found that when I turned clockwise, it was triggering counterclockwise events. When I turned counterclockwise, it was triggering clockwise events. So I came and I changed it to three and two, recompiled and uploaded it, and now it was working in the proper direction. So you'll see we're defining direction clockwise zero x one zero, define direction, or sorry, counterclockwise, clockwise, 0x20, these are hex values, 
define our start as 0x0. So this is the section of code that runs if the definition above was half step. So if half step, the table emits codes at 0, 0, and 1, 1, meaning it emits a code at the top and the bottom. So instead, we're using full step state, so it emits a code only at the very top of the, of the click. So define our clockwise final, define clockwise begin, define clockwise next, define counterclockwise. So this is that unsigned character table and it's running, figuring out all of its starts when it's clockwise, when it's counterclockwise, when one starts, when one, when the other one starts. This is what is making it so smooth for all of the code, right? When we turn this encoder, I have yet to find anything that is this clean. Everything else I find tends to every once in a while throw in a wrong direction turn, which when you're spinning isn't always that big of a deal, but I hate the little jump backs and I even see them in Redbird Sims and it drives me up the wall because I know it means that they don't have good software to bouncing like this. Now, that is what's creating the structure and the table. So next up, this is the uh, function we're gonna call during setup. So you've got your two main loops. You got your setup loop, which runs once when it plugs in and powers up or gets restarted. Then it runs the main loop, which runs over and over and over again, and that's your main code. So we need to call the rotary init during setup. So that's why it says call this during setup. So this is a function, so void function. So for integer i, so we're declaring this as a local integer, and i is less than num rotaries i++. So it's a for loop that just keeps adding 1 to i until it gets to be less than the number of rotaries. When it hits that same number, it's now going to um, exit the for loop. So that just means it's going to run once for us because we only have one encoder. However, if we had five encoders, it would go, it would start at zero, it'd run through and keep adding until it got to be less than five. So when it got to four, it'd run that. When it came around, it was now five, it now exits. Pin mode, so rotaries i dot pin one. So this is telling us, and it's picking up that information from above where we define those pins, hence 2301, right? So it's got our rotaries. So you got your pin modes, pin one, pin two, and we're setting these to input mode uh, because we're not using input pull-up because they are not defined as pull-ups. And if de defined as enabled pull-ups, then the digital write is going to make sure to set those pins high uh, on the initialization so that when the main loop starts, it doesn't trigger an event. Read input pins, process the events, call either from a loop or an interrupt. We are going to have a function called check all encoders. It's not a big deal because we aren't running multiple encoders, but if you had multiple encoders, this is a faster way than so for this, it's going to run number of rotaries and result is equal to rotary process i because that's going to call the rotary process. And then if result is direction counterclockwise, we're going to send this command. So command channel. So at the start, k command. So it's going out the one channel, command one channel. We're going to send the emulate command. And then we've got the device. So this is the VJoy and the second instance, right? Because the first instance would be zero. We want to fire off button 10 and we want to do a press. Of course, it hits the end, so that sent it all. And then we also send to the debug, hey, button 10, uh, encoder, counterclockwise turn. So that's a nice way to see if it's turning the right way because you'll see it in the debug channel. If the result is direction clockwise, then instead you're going to send button 11. So copy, paste, done. Boolean. So we're going to set up the Boolean for the encoder switch previous state high 
and we're going to set the button encoder switch state to high because this is an input pull up so we want to have both set states set to high so it doesn't send off an event and trigger a button press we're using boolean because it can be zero one high low i could put ones here it would achieve the same thing this is needed to have a previous state and a current state so every time on the loop we're going to check the switches and we're only going to run a function if it's different than the previous pass through the loop so now when we go to the eight button modes we're going to do the same thing we're going to create a boolean for the button and its state and the same thing but a ps or previous state now remember that one button, which is going to be the flight director or the course button, it's the only one that is reversed because we have to tie this to a voltage, not to ground. So instead, we want it to make sure that it starts out low so it doesn't trigger an event off the start. So that's the only one that's going to be different. And again, it's because it's tied to D13. Rotary selector switch defined. So same thing, we're gonna set up and define our rotary selector switch. So here we're gonna need an integer because that switch can be one through six. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna start it off at one. So it at least tells the sim we're in switch state one. If you move it, it'll always update it, um, but that's just something to keep in mind. And again, same thing, we're gonna set all of these switch states and previous states to high. And even though there isn't actually a pin for switch position six, remember we're gonna change these by doing a check, right? We're gonna run a, a separate logic if statement um, to look at all the other switch states, figure out what it should be. Void setup. So this is now, we've defined everything. Now we are actually running the first bit of code. This is what runs when we first set up the Arduino when power's on or if you were to press the reset the reset button on the board itself. So serial.begin, so the first thing it's gonna do is it's gonna open up the serial port, set it to 115 baud, so as high speed as we can run. We're going to attach all the callbacks, so that's running a function, attach command callbacks, that's all the way at the top, this function right here, attach callbacks. So going all the way back up here, running this function to set all those callbacks. Then we're going to initialize the LCD. So we initialize it, we backlight it, we set the cursor to zero, zero. I'm going to print init. I'm going to delay for one second. I'm then going to clear it. I'm going to delay for a second. I'm going to reset to zero, zero. I'm going to print done. I'm going to delay for a second, going to reset to zero, zero, and I'm going to print uh, blank it out. So this is going to give you a visual sign that init done um, just to write something on the screen lets you know that's working at least. Now we're going to set up our mode buttons. Now again, generally I would set up variables for these pins, assign that to the pin, and then come down here and call it as a variable. Again, due to variable space, and we were starting to chew through all of our available bytes, uh, I chose to forego that and directly call the pins. And so that's why I put a comment. This is the autopilot mode pin. This is the heading pin, the altitude pin. That's normally what you would have seen here. So instead, uh, A0, input pull-up, A1, input pull-up, A2, input pull-up, A3, input pull-up, 10, input pull-up, 11, input pull-up, 12, input pull-up. But like we said, that last one on 13 needs to run as input mode because we're going to drive it with voltage and the rest just tying them to ground. Then we're going to define our rotary encoder. So rotary init. So it's going to run the init function for the rotaries and take care of them. And then of course, pin four, we need to set that to pull up because that is going to be our encoder switch. Then our rotary selector switch, pin mode five, six, seven, eight, nine. So all those pins it's attached to, input pull up, 
And again, that's for switch position one through five. And because we're out of pins, six is floating, has not connect, has no connection. And what we're going to do with it is we're going to check all of these to figure out what state six should be in. Now we get to the meat of the code. Here we're going to start the main loop. So it's just void loop. And the process income serial data. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to messenger dot feed in serial data. So we're going to take the messenger um, function and we're going to call the feed in serial data. And so it's going to start reading in the data and then plugging that into our callback functions. So this is how we read in the data and then filter that into the callback functions. Next up, I am going to check all the button modes. So it's going to do a digital read, right, of all of these pins to set up what the current state of each one of these switches is. If we're going to do the same thing. We're now going to read the rotary switch state. So again, switch position one current state read five, read six, seven, eight, nine, that gets those. We're also then going to read the encoder button. So button underscore E switch state, digital read of four. Then we're going to check all encoders. So it runs this function to check the encoders and run any events if it's sensing the encoders are doing something. Now what we're going to do is we're going to figure out if the encoder switch button, so that state that it just read, if it does not equal the previous switch state, then it's going to run its function. Otherwise, if they match, so if they're both set to high currently, it's just going to skip on by and, and do nothing. So this processes it much faster and doesn't cause delays inside of your main loop which can make the uh, encoders um, miss, miss clicks and not be as clean. This works excellent every time. If it is different, well, it's going to come down. And here it's going to say, okay, well, the switch state is now low because somebody pressed the button, which means it's being held to ground, so it's low. Well, when that switch is done, send the emulate to that VJoy device, button nine. So the way I set up the buttons is one through eight is the autopilot modes, nine is the push button on the rotary encoder, and 10 and 11 are the rotary encoder turns. When it's done sending that, it's gonna set the previous state to low, short delay, just to make sure everything triggers on the next pass through if it sensed that the button is now high and the previous switch state was low then it's going to come through and it's going to just reset itself to high now before we move on to each of the autopilot mode buttons i wanted to check the rotary switch we're comparing and checking if rotary switch position current state is a one and two is a one and three is a one and four is a one and five is a one or they're all highs. So we're basically going and saying, hey, if all of these are high, go ahead and tell the system that rotary switch position six state is low. Because it has to be, because not a single one of those is actually low. They're all not selected. So the only thing left could be is number six is selected. Otherwise, we're going to tell the system that switch six's state is high, meaning if any one of these was high, then this guy has to be, or sorry, if any one of these is low, then this guy has to be a high. Just has to be because they're already done. So that was how we got away with not needing a pin for switch position six. We're going to run that exact same code style on all of our buttons. If the autopilot button state does not equal the autopilot previous state, then run this, run this if. If it's low, 
then set the previous state to low and send this command, right? Emulate one button one press and we just put a short little pause delay before continuing on and running the loop. If it's high, then set it back to high. And we just copy and paste and we're just coming through and just changing, you know, which which comparators, which button. Copy and paste, paste, paste. So again, altitude button, um, the approach button, the reverse button, the IAS button, the nav button, and then finally the course button, um, which will fire off to button eight. Finally, we come down and we want to set our switch value as well as write text to the screen. If switch position one state does not equal switch one position state, so meaning it just went low, then check it, it went low. We're gonna set the switch state. So we set that variable, we set the previous back to low. We're gonna go down to the bottom left, so zero and three. We're basically going to, for 10 characters, blank out that row. We're going to set the cursor back to 0, 3, and then we're going to print ALT. So that way, whatever text we put down there, we cleared it out when it went into that mode, and now we go back to altitude. Then we're going to send to SPAD messenger command. So we're going to tell SPAD the command channel for send, right, selector switch, and we're going to send the value of RSWS, which is right here. So boom. That's what we're sending up to it. If it's not in that, so it's now no longer low, then we set the previous switch state back to high. That's all we do. And then we rinse and repeat. For position two, again, same thing, twos. We got the gap. Now we're going to go VS mode. So we've decided that position two is VS, and we're going to update SPAD. And then we do the same thing, set it high for three, we're going to set the value to three, blank it out, IAS mode. So again, this could just be SPD if you'd rather it said speed or FLC, whatever you want to put for it, you can change that text. And it's going to update spad.next that we're in that mode because we're going to use that to then write the value function uh, that goes into the window to the right of this starting at position 10. So when we're in position four, that's going to be heading mode. Then we're going to have it in course mode. And then for future, I'm going to get this all set up and working with the transponder. And that's it. It sets all that. And again, it was figuring this out because of the if statement we did above to sort out whether or not that switch was the way it is. So we just added in that little bit of extra. And that is it. That's how we run through the code. In the next video, we're going to go through how to add the autopilot now into SPAD next, and then how to leverage the VJoy device, the script panel to enable us to link all of it to the different aircrafts. So not just defaults either. This means whether it'll be standard SIM values or LVARs, SPAD.next is going to keep track of that for us. And on a plane by plane basis, automatically load that profile and not require us to modify any more Arduino code in this unit. All right, guys, hit that like button, subscribe if you haven't, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.